And I'd just like to say welcome to CAT and thank you for the continued partnership. We've worked with uh, the NICA's Chinese Health Coalition many times to uh, welcome their presenters on various topics for flex days, for these trans awareness days. And um, now we have, we're so fortunate to have you here for Transgender Week of Resilience and Action. So thank you. And I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Daruni, um, for inviting me to come and present to your group today. Um, so today we'll be talking about cultural humility. Um, so I think this fits really perfectly into this topic of um, transgender awareness and resilience. Um, just in general, working with people who are who may be coming from different cultures than us, working with uh, communities of diverse populations, this is going to be something that we'll constantly run into as um, people who work in health and human services. So I feel really fortunate to be here with you all shedding light on this topic, and I hope that while today, you know, we're only going to be here for about an hour, an hour and 20 or so, um, I hope that this kind of starts the conversation or continues the conversation on cultural humility and why it's important. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All righty. Um, all right, moving along. Um, so I, I think just as a uh, as kind of some basic housekeeping. Um, I'm going to keep the lines muted throughout the presentation, um, but feel free to unmute yourselves throughout the uh, presentation if you have any questions. And I'm also, um, I'm just making sure that I have my chat available and handy to me now. So if you have any questions, feel free to go in the chat. I'm very comfortable with looking at my chat while I present. So that is all good. Um, and then after we close out today's training, I'm going to be sending a link to an evaluation form that just helps me understand how um, I did today, how I did with my presentation today. And it also helps us continue to come back to uh, CCSF and other organizations and other classes, other schools in San Francisco to do uh, presentations on this topic. So I would really appreciate um, any and all of your help on that and uh, making sure that we have evaluations from all of you. And a little bit about myself. So my name is Kat. I am a project coordinator at Nico's Chinese Health Coalition. Um, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about my organization later, but I've been here for about uh, three years now. I've been doing uh, trainings on cultural humility to students and professionals all around the Bay Area on this topic. I feel like this is maybe my, what now, maybe fourth or fifth class with uh, Daruni or fourth or fifth time working with Andrew. Um, it's It's been a wild ride. I can't believe it's been three years, but here we are. And I'm so excited um, to be here with you all. It's always a different and very enlightening conversation. Um, and here is a little bit about my organization, Nikos. So we're a nonprofit based in San Francisco Chinatown, and our mission is to enhance the health and well-being of our city's Chinese community. Um, so we are located in San Francisco Chinatown, and we've been um, in operation since 1985. And maybe you haven't you have heard of us, but if you haven't, you may have heard of one of our five founding organizations that make up our NICOS acronym. So that stands for um, Northeast Medical Services or NEMS, Chinese Hospital, Onloft Lifeways, and Self-Help for the Elderly. Um, I used to be called Independent Physicians Association, and now it's called um, Chinese Community Healthcare. I, I don't even remember. CCHCA, there's, a, there's an acronym for that too, but um, yeah, we that was those were our five founding members, and now we are a partnership of over thirty plus public, private, and community groups. 
So of course, today's topic is about cultural humility. And um, before we move on, I wanted to ask you all, um, what is culture? What do you think culture is? What, does, what do you think of when you think of culture? Some aspects of culture? Any thoughts? I see some in the chat, um, set of beliefs or practices, the way of life for people, anything else? Those are great responses. It's part of one's identity, absolutely. Um, and we are going to dive a little bit deeper into what culture and identity means for all of us. So um a way to hold people that are like-minded yeah there's um we form a culture because every because several people of a group all believe in a certain way of life all um maybe subscribe to a specific identity um these are all really great examples and um, i highlighted two things here that i commonly hear when i ask this question um, and that's, of course, that culture comes from beliefs or value systems or actions. And then also that these things can be passed down from families or other influences and taught uh, generation after generation. So there is a, a generational aspect to culture as well. Um, there, there have been cultures that have been formed long before us that we may identify with now, right? So culture itself can be very broad um, but we do have our own definition that we like to share uh, my organization likes to share when we do these presentations and um, for us culture is made up of shared experiences or commonalities that have developed and continue to evolve continue to change in relation to how social and political systems influence the following so race gender disability or ability status, ethnicity, and so on. Um, the, that's all just to say that, um, you know, people themselves change over time. Who you are now, what is most important to you and your life now might be different from five years ago. Um, how you interact with all of these variables um, on this, on this uh, page right now um, can change how you perceive the world and yourself. And then lastly, um, this final bullet here, uh, other axes of identification within a historical context. Um, this just means that certain life experiences themselves can be a cultural identity, right? Um, so it could, could it be possible, for example, um, that people in recovery um or refugees feel that this aspect of their identity is more important to them than their gender or their education level or where they come from is that possible seeing some nods yeah absolutely um this is why we shouldn't ever assume that just because someone is um asian american that someone you know like me is filipina um, that I have all of the answers on how to communicate with them, how to um, serve them, how to give them the best um, health services, because we never know what sort of ex stories, experiences, lived experiences, any of our clients come to us with. And um, I'm guessing, um, that some of you may have been thinking about culture um, and cultural humility maybe a little bit before my presentation today. Um, but I would love to know, why do you think culture is important in health? Why are we here talking about cultural humility today? Any thoughts? And feel free to unmute as well and use the chat. I think there's a comment about maybe welcoming people, um, 
to understand, to respect, uh, empathy, um, having different experiences with healthcare, maybe experiences that we don't understand, but we have to find a way to find to have empathy and um, see where our clients are coming from, right? Um, cultural forces are so extremely powerful in healthcare. And there's a few reasons why, and I've cited a few here. You know, of course, culture is a powerful factor in in health access and um, well-being. So that just that just says a little bit about um, there's a comment here about inequity and stereotyping. Um, also, quality healthcare should be appropriate and uh, to the culturally specific needs of a community you serve. So for example, you wouldn't set up a health clinic in San Francisco Chinatown if your staff can't speak Cantonese, right? Um, or you don't know how to anticipate the needs of this community, uh, of, of older adults or of um, limited English proficient uh, clients. So we shouldn't expect people to change themselves in order to fit our services. So it shouldn't be, uh, that way. It should be the other way around. How can we make our services change to make the, them more accessible to our community? I'm going to go ahead and um, mute the sound real quick. I think I'm getting a little distracted from some sounds, but that's all good. I would love, I really love some of your um, comments and, and thoughts in the chat. I think that we're definitely going to dive into um, some of these issues. And um, to move us right along, um, it's also important that to understand that all of us belong to many different cultures, right? Um, that each one of us is comprised of multiple cultures, multiple identities, and that makes us uniquely us. Uh, which brings us to our next term of intersectionality. Um, just a show of faces, thumbs up, thumbs down, anything that you have. Are you familiar with this term before? Have you heard of this term, intersectionality? See some nods and thumbs ups. Great, yeah. Um, so intersectionality is defined as a lens through which you see your identity come and collide, interlock and intersect. All that means is that each one of us is composed of multiple parts, you know, again, multiple cultures, multiple identities. I am not only Filipino, I am also a woman, I am also an immigrant, I am also a scholar, I'm highly educated, I am also cisgender. And all of these aspects of me have shaped um, me into who I am, into how I access privilege, how I access healthcare and other um, institutions. So not only are we all unique, right? Not only are we all completely unique and we have our own lived experiences that make us our own person, but these unique experiences also shape the way that we interact with healthcare, with um, higher education, with the workforce, and so much more. And um, while many of us, you know, very, very familiar with this term, this is a term that comes up um, in many trainings about cultural humility, about diversity, and et cetera. Um, I noticed that they seldom ever credit the um, Black woman scholar who coined it. So if in case you'd like to dive deeper into this at a later time, this is Kimberly Crenshaw, who actually used this theory uh, to describe factors of discrimination law so um, that weren't being appreciated by the courts. So her research argued that women of color and especially Black women would be the most impacted by social justice and human rights issues um, in the court of law. And culture is important in our work as healthcare providers, as community health workers, and many other roles that provide services to other people. Um, because we need to understand that people aren't just different, right? Um, but also that these differences uh, create immensely different outcomes for the most vulnerable people in our communities. 
So we learn, for example, that people's cultures can impact their healthcare choices. I think there was a very brief comment around that about like your morals um, and life support, things like that. Um, we also have to recognize that we are in a society that also does not allow equal privileges to everyone. So would these choices even be available to everyone? The behaviors that we study about um, people from certain cultures can only get us so far. And this is where cultural humility comes in. So cultural humility means a process of self-reflection and discovery in order to build honest and trustworthy relationships. So it's really rooted in the practice of self-reflection and um, you acknowledging people for who they are. So you accept others as the experts of their own lives, um, understanding that even though you are coming from CCSF, you have this great education, you're gonna go out in the community, that you have all of this educational coursework behind you, you will never be an expert, right? Um, instead, you are entering a relationship with your clients um, with the intention of sharing trust, of sharing power, and in order, uh, and in doing that, providing them honest and quality care. So, um, for those of us who are here, um, have you heard of the term cultural humility or cultural competence? Do you use them interchangeably? Anything like that? I would love to hear. Have you heard one or either of these terms, both of them? Do you mind to repeat the question one more time, please? Yes. Um, so I would love to hear from you all if you have heard of the term cultural humility or maybe if you have heard of the term of cultural competence. And it looks like uh, you've learned both terms in class, perfect. Um, so what I would love to kind of do in this slide is to just really break down the differences between them two, um, because oftentimes I see in, um, when in the healthcare setting that these terms are sometimes used interchangeably. So cultural humility is different from competence in a few different ways. And this is not to say that competence, cultural competence is not useful. Um, so what I like to say is again, cultural humility is about self-exploration. It's all about um, un you know, reflecting within you and understanding um, where your biases are, what stereotypes you carry about other people. And now competence is more about learning how, about others, learning how to effectively communicate with various different groups. So understanding their behaviors, their customs and languages, et cetera. And I like to say that, um, yeah, so cultural humility is deeper, um, similar to equality and versus equity, absolutely. Um, I think that there is an emerging sort of reclaiming of competence once again that is a really interesting sort of uh, conversation about um, how co cultural competence can be complementary to cultural humility because for example cultural competence might be really important if you work with a lot of members of a specific uh, community so my organization nikos for example we provide most of our services to the Chinese community in Chinatown. So we, our staff have a basic understanding of the languages represented, the customs of um, immigrated Chinese in our community, and many, many more. But then at the same time, we have to recognize that cultures are not monolithic, that our services can only get us so far if we treat everyone the exact same way. So the process of undoing these preconceived ideas and then still taking clients as individuals, that is part of the humility piece. And this is truly the harder part of the process um, to confront yourself, to understand your strengths, your shortcomings, and understanding how our own power and privilege um, affects how we provide care to others. Um, but it's such an important part of checking in with yourself to making sure that 
your processes and how you connect with others is uh, equitable and culturally humble. And I very much um, agreed with this comment that some schools still do not teach or know about cultural humility. Um, I'm still working with several service providers who are years into their practice and have never even heard of the term. So I think that it's a very unique thing that CCSF and other really great uh, programs in San Francisco make this such a, um, a priority as well. And I have a quick video that I'd like to share. Um, so cultural humility has just become a very huge, um, I feel like has become even more and more popular in the last year. My requests for trainings have, you know, doubled, tripled in the last year. And I think a lot of it has had to do with um, the conversations around race, around equity, in our all of our systems, not just in healthcare, but throughout our, our the way that we navigate our day to day lives. And um, I always like to show this video about cultural humility and the two scholars who founded this term. Um, they're actually local in the Bay Area. So I'm going to go ahead and play this quick video so you can get to know more about the people who coined these ter this term of cultural humility and its three main uh, principles. One word to describe cultural humility for me is, is love, actually. If I had to encapsulate cultural humility, the whole concepts of cultural humility, um, it doesn't do it justice, but the word that I think of it is essence. Escuchar. Being. You. Opening. Receive. Compassion. Love. The principles of cultural humility offer one more framework to contribute to what has got to be our ultimate goal, yes? Our ultimate goal is that there will be a sense of equity, a sense of equality, and a, a kind of and, and a kind of respect that we are driving forward. Cultural humility that is, is a multi-dimensional concept and, and certainly um, Melanie Tervalon and I um, conceptualized three dimensions. The first is lifelong learning and critical self-reflection. And in that critical self-reflection it is the understanding of how each of us Every single one of us is a complicated, multi-dimensional human being. Each of us comes with our own histories and stories, our heritage, our point of view. You're looking at me now. I am very fair-skinned. When I was a little girl, my hair was blonde. My eyes are blue. People often tried to call me anything but African-American. I have a history. My identity is rooted in that history. My parents gave me the knowledge of my own social identity and my own experience in life has created that. I get to say who I am. The second tenet uh, after uh, self-reflection and ongoing lifelong learning and development is, is this notion that we must mitigate the power imbalances to recognize and mitigate the power imbalances that are inherent often in our clinician um, patient or clinician client or um, service provider community dynamics. And then finally, the, the piece that I would offer that Jan and I feel people often either don't read or don't like, which is, and the institution has to model these principles as well.
An African American nurse is caring for a middle-aged Latina woman several hours after the patient had undergone surgery. A Latino physician on a consult service approached the bedside and noting the moaning patient, commented to the nurse that the patient appeared to be in a great deal of post-operative pain. The nurse summarily dismissed his perception, informing him that she took a course in nursing school in cross-cultural medicine and knew that Hispanic patients overexpressed the pain that they're feeling. The Latino physician had a difficult time influencing the perspective of this nurse, who focused on her self-proclaimed cultural expertise. It was curious to this Latino physician, who first of all was Latino, not like all, um, in his case, not like all Mexican-Americans know everything there is to know about Mexican-American patients. That wasn't it, but he might have been a resource for that African-American nurse in that moment. Um, that she didn't feel like she needed, again, because she had bought into this notion of competence, of cultural competence. The distinction between cultural humility and cultural competence was that we were in a, in a process and a relationship that had many other layers to it, and that we were less comfortable with, this, with even the term of competence in a way that I think people understand well, and that it implies, especially for people who are providers and are trained in academia, that you are then all-knowing and all-powerful. And we felt like that was not what was happening for us as we were learning from community and understanding in a, in a very practical way how families were coming to the hospital and feeling as if they really were not being heard from their own heritage and history, and how that impacted what they came to the hospital with that we could, didn't know anything about, hadn't even a clue about. For us, this is part of the humility piece of it, getting to understand that, not trying to humiliate you, not trying to make you feel bad, trying to help us all understand that, there, that life is like this, and to, in a certain sense, be really happy about not knowing. In April of 1992, in the wake of the Los Angeles riots, following the initial not guilty verdict of the police officers accused of beating Mr. King, the Children's Hospital Oakland community was compelled to meet in a series of highly charged sessions to expose and critique our own patterns of institutional racism, injustice, and inequity. My name is Dr. Melanie Turvalon, and I am Director of Multicultural Affairs here at Children's Hospital Oakland. I want to thank everybody for coming to what is a celebration for me of this year. Jan and I had the good fortune, really, to be together in the same place when this work was evolving. Jan and I, while we're several years difference in age, are both African-American women and both raised by women who were teachers. And we come out of that, and, and fathers who were working men who come out of that Southern tradition and who participated fully in the civil rights movement in the way that meant that they made sacrifices and their children made sacrifices and they taught us about those sacrifices and raised us each in ways to understand that we were here to serve. All righty. Um, so as you can see here, oops. Um, so that was actually a snippet of a 30 minute long video that just loaded on my page now of um, a, a mini documentary about cultural humility about Melanie Turvalon and Jan Murray Garcia who founded this concept and it's free to watch on YouTube so I highly encourage you to take a look at that at another time um, if you're interested in learning more. And um, just actually for convenience, I'm gonna go ahead and post the link here in our chat now so that you all can kind of take a look at that in this moment. So let me go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, yeah, just in case you wanted to, to review it at another time. Perfect. And um, with that being said, and thank you, Andrew, for uh, showing that it's also in the page. Uh, so the rest of this presentation, I really want to focus on breaking down those three principles of cultural humility that were mentioned in the video. So 
uh, beginning first with lifelong learning and critical self-reflection. So as the video discussed, lifelong learning and critical self-reflection are crucial principles to practicing cultural humility. This means getting comfortable with not knowing and accepting that we have limits to our knowledge, that we don't have the answers to everything, and more importantly, that we're eager to be open and learn more. Um, and when you do engage in learning, there's also something I always like to mention that there is a difference between learning for care and learning merely out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. So cultural humility is not about feeding some insatiable curiosity, right? When you ask questions of your clients, constantly reflect, self-reflect and interrogate what you are seeking to learn and why. So this is a very big issue that I see happening with people who work with uh, a lot with the trans community, for example. Um, some people are really trying to do some yoga, bend over backwards and get real stretchy with trying to figure out what, the, what a gender, uh, what gender a person identifies with, um, as if that's the only thing that defines them. And the same thing goes for people who are mixed race. Um, I've heard of stories of people um, seeking health care and their health care practitioners uh, can't figure out um, if they are this race or this ethnicity or another because their nose looks like this, but their hair looks like another way. And all of this is to say, does this information really help you more effectively communicate with this person? Does this um, information um, help you become a better healthcare provider to this person? Um, or is this just something that you are just genuinely curious about? These are questions that we need to ask ourselves before we engage with, um, with our clients in dialogue and the people that we serve. And then lastly, lifelong learning is about accepting that you cannot be an expert on someone else or a group of people. Um, it shouldn't be about uh, service providers exerting their expertise or authority on a subject matter, especially when the situation at hand is um, promoting health and wellness. Both parties, the service provider and the client, should really be viewed as equally knowing, equally learning participants. And then moving on along um, to my next concept, which is recognizing and challenging inequities. Before we move along, do we have any thoughts or questions? All righty. So cultural humility sounds easy enough, right? Uh, to treat people like individuals, to listen to their needs, but there are many reasons why cultural humility is not always easy. There are always, there are many reasons uh, why we have to have these conversations, why we have to try to be culturally humble. So we know that people are different, that people come from different cultures. We all come from different cultures, everyone here, right? So what happens when these cultures clash? So now in these, this next section, I will outline a few words and phrases that we likely have already heard or have already um, defined in the past, but hopefully having a clear definition here will bring them some greater clarity and context. So first, um, bias. This is a tendency or preference towards a certain perspective that prevents us from being impartial. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that or when I hear that definition, I think that everyone has a bias, right? Every single one of us has a bias. And I have a quick exercise for you in the next slide to show you how easy it is for any one of us to develop a bias. So in a minute, I, will, I would love to do this activity with everyone here. Um, so in a minute, I will ask you to unmute if you're comfortable. And in the count of me, in my count of three, I want us to all say the word folk out loud six times. And then at the end of that, I'm going to ask you a question and you just say the first thing that comes to mind. Does that sound good? All righty. Okay. So 
let's do this. So on the count of three, I want us all to say folk six times. Ready? One, two, three. What is the white part of an egg called? Oh, oh, yolk. White. The white part. Egg whites. Egg whites. There you go. All right. So some of us took a minute and said egg whites, but some people did say yolk, right? Yes. I did. So, so someone who said yolk, could you share a little bit about why you said yolk? Well, because I kept on saying folk, 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 oh. folk, folk. And then you asked the question, what was the part the egg white? I mean, what was the part of it? Why part are they called? I just already heard in my head, yolk. So I said yolk. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yolk. True. Exactly. So it rhymed, right? I made you say the word six times. I said you know, we said folk six times, yolk rhymes with folk, right? Um, so that's, uh, that's basically uh, what I did just now is a psychological term actually called priming. So what I did was I primed you into um, saying the word folk six times. And when I asked you to respond, your brain automatically answered the question with the most immediate answer that it could provide, right? So with that, um, there are some research that say that it only takes us six times to hear, see, or experience something for us to develop a bias on it. So that's why I like to share this exercise. So with that in mind, um, think of any stories that you may have heard about, about Asian Americans, about Latinx Americans, um, about various different groups, about transgender, people, okay? Um, think about any stories you may have heard about any of these communities. Um, have you heard stories that have developed a bias maybe six times? More than six times? So when we act on impulse, when we think, when we don't think before we communicate, our deeply rooted bias can make us say the wrong decision or uh, make the wrong decision or say the wrong thing. So part of cultural humility is understanding that any one of us can develop these biases. There are stories, um, maybe disparaging stories that we have heard about various people in our community that make it difficult for us to act on impulse without acting against, uh, against a bias. So what we can do is to understand that every one of us here are not perfect, but that we are all willing to learn and that we will do our best to minimize harmful mistakes. So moving right along, um, and just for the sake of time, um, here are a few more definitions that I wanted to share, but prejudice is um, really in the name, right? It's a prejudgment about someone um, it's an attitude towards members of a group of uh, people based on their membership in that particular group. And then stereotypes are uh, generalizations that are applied widely across all people. And then lastly, discrimination is defined as the unfair treatment of people based on their identities and their culture. So these dynamics of difference can be overt or explicit, right? They can be people who are outwardly saying racist things, people who are outwardly saying transphobic things, but then at the same time, our biases can also be hidden. And often these are harder to identify and as a result, harder to address. So when implicit biases go unchecked, this is when you can really cause discomfort or even harm. So implicit biases are attitudes or stereotypes that affect our actions in an unconscious manner. So looking back on that folk exercise, right? Um, someone once told me when I did this presentation that um, they said the wrong thing because they let their brain operate on autopilot, which is exactly right. It's when we are on autopilot that we act on implicit biases, even though it is not even in our intentions to cause harm or make mistakes. So this might mean that any one of us here and myself included 
um, may firmly stand against racism, against xenophobia, um, but it is still certainly possible that we are still creating people uh, barriers for people of color, for immigrants or other groups without even knowing it. So our implicit biases uh, create barriers to service by impacting our decisions, our perceptions, our behaviors, and in the worst cases, implicit bias can also affect how we treat and communicate with clients. So sometimes causing discomfort, frustration, or furthering oppression. So understanding the impacts of our implicit biases will take a great deal of learning, unlearning, and self-reflection. So with that, I wanted to show another quick video with some exercises. Um, so let me go ahead and play this one. Hello everyone, I'm Joshua Bates, and I am a social policy analyst at the Kerwin Institute. In the previous lesson, we defined implicit bias as those attitudes and stereotypes that affect our understanding actions and decisions in an unconscious manner. But what does it mean to have thoughts and associations that you're unaware of? What does that look and feel like? And why does it even matter? Let's try bringing implicit bias to life by doing some quick exercises. As you'll soon see, these exercises are very simple. The purpose is not whether or not you can complete them, but what they show us about how our brains work. Let's start by playing a game of word association. Think or say aloud the word that should go in the blank. Night and, black and, young and. Obviously, there was nothing difficult about that exercise. Not only was it easy to fill in the blanks, you likely had a response ready long before you were prompted to fill it in. This is the power of our implicit cognition and our lightning fast associations. When faced with incomplete information, we rely on associative memory to quickly fill in the gaps. It's also important to know that most people have the same response. It is possible to have similar associations shared across various groups of people. We usually refer to these as norms or stereotypes. For the next activity, please read aloud the following paragraph. I'm gonna go ahead and pause and anyone who wants to read it. <laughs> Read it all out. You said read it all out. Oh yeah, please go ahead. Hold on, your picture is like in the way of the corner. <laughs> Let me see if I can read. Um, if you can read this paragraph, it's because our minds are very good at putting together pieces of information in a way that is easy for us to make sense of. Our minds do this automatically without our conscious control. Awesome, thank you so much. I don't know who, who said it on my PW, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and continue the video and there's another- Oh, sorry, activity. my name is Priscilla. Oh, okay, thank you. Alrighty, gonna move along. This was a horribly misspelled paragraph, yet you were able to read it without much difficulty at all. Even if it took you a little longer to read, your unconscious cognition automatically made sense of the paragraph based on your ability to associate it with words you already know. Let's look at another example. Most of us see ABC. Similarly, here we see 12, 13, and 14. Even though the middle figure in those images never changed, our brains are able to form different perceptions of the same image based only on the context surrounding. And this is done without our intention or control. What these three exercises demonstrate is the automatic, adaptive, and associative nature of our implicit processing. When faced with otherwise ambiguous or confusing content, our brains try to quickly make sense of it by relying on associations we've stored in our memory. Importantly, these stored associations don't have to be based on accurate and logical information. By just seeing concepts grouped together repeatedly, we can internalize associations that are skewed, distorted, and inaccurate. Now, let's go through one final exercise that really speaks to the question of why implicit bias matters. On the screen, you will see a column of words. When prompted, please say aloud the color of each word, not what the word says. Try not to read the words, just say what color it is. Ready? Here we go. 
All right, who's going to try this one with me? Anyone? I will. All right, Luke. So I'll let the, the video play and then you can follow along the prompt. How are you? This can't be the trick. Right. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, that yeah. Was, so you're just seeing, they were, yeah. <laughs> they were providing a counter. Well, that that's fine. We all know we yes. know how to read as well. <laughs> okay. Yes. So this one, the colors match the the words. So I'll yes. let you play along to the next one. Right. Great. Let's try it again with a similar set of words. Remember, Here just we go. say the color of the word. Don't read the word. Ready? Go. Blue, red, brown, green, red, orange, blue, green, brown, orange. This assessment. <laughs> that was really great. I think that you did a really great job. Well, it wasn't the point of the exercise, but. I mean, I, I think that it speaks to how clearly you can um, think on the spot. So most of the time that is, it, it was still a little bit harder than the first set of words, right? Yes, yeah, sometimes. absolutely. So I'm going to go ahead and let the video continue and um, they can explain a little bit more about why that is. Known as the Stroop task is a psychological task that looks at the dynamics of our automatic processing. For most folks, the first screen was simple. The color and the words themselves matched. Therefore, the results of your implicit inclination to read the words aligned with your explicit directions to say the color. On the other hand, your automatic inclination to read the words the second time may have taken a little bit longer. As this demonstrates, our implicit and explicit goals can and often do diverge. This is why implicit bias matters. While we like to think of ourselves as rational and logical adults, the reality is a lot of our thought processes are occurring unconsciously without our intention and control. Those implicit processes, when activated, can derail even the most sincere explicit intentions. There are limits to the amount of information you can consciously process at any given time. In fact, research shows that on average, we can only consciously process between five and nine stimuli at a time. So that phone number you misremembered was at the limit of your capacity to process information consciously. We rely on our implicit cognition to move through the world. Given this, uncovering your biases and understanding their effects on your life and others is critical to ensuring that intentions and outcomes align. In the next lesson, we're going to dive more deeply into the origin of our biases, how they form and where they come from. Hello, everyone. Oh, I'm John. Saying it again. All right. Well, um, thank you so much for those of us who participated along with that video, whether you did it um, independently or out loud. Um, so you can still see my screen and you can see that um, this entire website is dedicated towards um, implicit bias training. And there are a ton of modules and a ton of videos kind of embedded throughout. Um, I really find this uh, resource very helpful. Um, I think that if this is something, even as uh, people who are familiar with cultural humility or implicit bias, there are still a lot of lessons um, about how implicit bias works on um, in within your brain and um, how it manifests into the real world. So I would highly encourage you to look at that resource as well. Uh, which I have just included in the chat. Alrighty, so moving along, does anyone have any questions before I move on? Alrighty. So why does implicit bias matter? Um, our, again, our implicit biases um, or implicit associations may not always align with our own beliefs. So it is certainly possible that we are still creating barriers for people, even though we strongly advocate against um, creating those barriers. And um, this is really um, 
all just to say that implicit bias is something that is hard to identify, but that doesn't mean that that gets, gives us a get out of jail free card. We have to continue to be accountable for all of our biases, whether they are implicit, explicit, um, whether we know them or whether we are still working to identify them. Um, and this takes a great deal of learning, unlearning and self-reflection. So kind of uh, switching gears, but I wanted to also talk about inclusive language. One way that we can minimize our biased actions is through the way that we talk and communicate with others. So inclusive language is put simply language that is re respectful, that is accurate and relevant to all. So practicing inclusive language is an easy way for any one of us to make sure that we are not always responding on autopilot. So before we dive into um, those best practices for inclusive language, I also wanted to highlight why inclusive language is needed in the first place. So I wanted to discuss how some aspects of our regular vocabulary can reproduce power to certain groups and think about why these are normalized, right? So in this slide, you can see all of these uh, professions that are suffixed by men. And this is an exercise that I'd like to encourage you to do on your own time to challenge yourselves to ungender these, um, these nouns. But for now, I wanted to point out that gender is just one example of how power uh, can be reproduced through language. If you can think of any other words or phrases that our society has normalized, please share some of those ideas in the chat box. And um, I will outline a few in the next slide. And real quick, I wanna answer this question. How can we learn what our implicit biases are? And that's a really great question. Um, there is not a perfect answer to that. Um, there is a tool that maybe some of you might be familiar with, but it's called the implicit association tool. Um, let me find a link for it real quick. Um, implicit association test. Um, I'm going to link it in the chat really quick right now. And this is a, um, a project that was spearheaded by Harvard University to kind of try to find a way to research implicit bias. And um, to this day, the data around um, the implicit association test is still not perfect. And because of that, there is really no easy way to, for any one of us to identify what our implicit biases are. So what I always like to say is that assume that you have biases Imp implicit biases about most people. And I think if you work, walk around the world, if you guide your communication around the world with the understanding that you should try to be respectful to everyone, then I think that's going to get you in a really, you know, that's going to take you a lot further um, than trying to do the implicit association test. Um, I do think that the uh, IAT is a good sort of launching point to start this conversation. Um, you're welcome to all try it. I think it's a very interesting sort of resource, but I would just instead, you know, rely on our sort of need to be respectful and empathetic to everyone. Um, and yeah, that's still a question that I hope that I can answer in the future as well. And we have some great um, examples in the chat, ladies and gentlemen, and in Spanish, um, there is only vic victima for victim, um, saying women when talking about those with childbearing capabilities. Yeah, these are all really great examples. Um, here are some that I always, uh, that I bring up in this conversation too. Um, there is um, the first one being, uh, referring to people as it, like they are objects. Um, so this is, again, thinking about ways your language can dehumanize and marginalize people by referring to them as objects. Um, another uh, sort of 
phrase or terminology or framing that I hear is referring to uh, people as the deaf, the blind, or the disabled, um, as if that is their only de identifiers, right? As if that is the only way we can these describe, we can these describe these people. So um, this really brings the question of who becomes empowered when we reduce people's identities to their disability or ability. Um, next term is ghetto. So whenever you hear someone use this word, what are they trying to convey or describe? What does their um, tone or their message say about communities of color, about neighborhoods of color, um, and et cetera? And then lastly, third world um, as a offspring of the third world you know i know that this term constantly evolves um, who sets the standard of what is developed versus underdeveloped first world versus third world and why did these identifiers exist in the first place so these are really just questions that i ask um, you know hypothetical questions because really i want this to be about um, this exercise to be about highlighting how power and language have a very strong and inseparable relationship. Um, and just like I said before, culture is constantly evolving and so is language. Um, what is considered uh, normal or popular language now can change over time. So it's possible that the words and phrases that we are using now are still not 100% nailing it right. Um, but as people who work with other people, it's incredibly important for us to have the patience and the humility as we continue to learn and continue to find ways to be more equitable, to be more inclusive in how we communicate. So here is our my last video for the evening, um, which is um, a quick uh, video on inclusive language practices. So going to, and you asked about people first language, so using inclusive language, and I believe this is important because everything that you do has been written or you're speaking or your communication and content, this is a, extremely important where we have to be more inclusive in the language that we choose. So going to people first language, uh, when we talk about ability status and mental health, historically we had a tendency to say disabled person, uh, wheelchair bound, blind person, you know, we define them based on their disability. And people first language is when you define them based on who they are. So a person with a disability. So if you take off with, they're just a person. <laughs> Someone who uses a wheelchair. You know, so it's putting the person first, opposed to putting the ability status or, you know, their blight or, you know, their color before who they are. You know, oh, this is a, African-American designer. Well, they're a designer that's African-American. So, you know, that's so important because it takes us away from trying to identify them and define them and recognize them as who they are. And you have some, especially on the task force, we receive questions all the time, even internally within the task force, where we say, where are all the African-American designers? Where are all the black designers? And, you know, we can't do a Google search and find them. And I've said to, I've had conversations with a few of the task force members saying, well, they're probably not putting, hi, my name is so-and-so, I'm an African-American designer. They're putting, hi, my name is so-and-so, I'm a designer. Like, they don't want to be defined, like, yes, they are a person, they're a per person of color, but that's not what defines them as who they are. Like, for them, they're a person. And, you know, remembering that in whatever form of fashion that we use it. Also, avoiding using the terms suffering from or afflicted with, um, differently abled or special. There's other terms I could say that I do not say just because they have such a negative connotation that I just don't even touch on them. Um, but just being respectful of individuals when you speak about them. And going to race and ethnicity, I love this quote from Henry Louis Gates where he says, identity is complex, its roots lie beneath the surface, as a product of events that we don't know about ourselves. You know, so the fact that we're, sometimes we want to silo people and say you're only this or you're only that, that's not the case, that's not true. But when we go to race and ethnicity, there's a lot, if you don't know, ask. <laughs> that's the best advice I give people, if you don't know, ask. 
you have some African Americans that want to be called black. You have some that want to be called African American. Personally, I like to be called caramel, but that's just my <laughs> skin tone. <laughs> But, you know, it doesn't bother me if someone calls me black. It doesn't call, bother me if someone calls me African American. Now, if you call me colored, then we have a problem. But you have some that actually, that doesn't bother them. So, you know, if you don't, if you don't know, ask. But ask with respectfully, like, uh, respectfully, not um, what are you. <laughs> Please don't say that. <laughs> that is so bad. Um, or in some cases, when you have this connotation of where, where are you from, and most of the time it's said to someone of a different race. And it's like, well, I'm from San Francisco. <laughs> That's where I'm from. So you know, just being respectful of people's backgrounds, their culture. Um, I have a few examples up here versus saying Indian. You could say Native American. But you know, it's now this movement of saying first people or first Americans, because technically they were here before America was invented. Um, also, Latino versus Hispanic versus Mexican. Not all Asians are Chinese. You know, some of these are commonly known, and some of them are, are not. Um, and one thing that in researching that was not previously on this slide, but I added today, was American versus US American, which um, is this new kind of movement towards this. Because when we say, I'm an American, it's essentially excluding people that live in Brazil and Argentina, and it kind of has this privileged type mindset that we're the only Americans in the world, where actually we're just on the North American continent. So you know, even if we were to say we're North Americans, there's Canadians that are North Americans, there's Mexicans that's North Americans. So you know, the advice now in the movement is to more say we're US Americans, opposed to just American. Um, then, and I know you don't really speak to religion much at AIGA, um, but I always like to include this. Not everyone celebrates Christmas. Not everyone celebrates their birthday. Um, in America, we very much have this Christian my, uh, majority type mindset uh, to the point where people say, when well, you say happy holidays, it's being too PC. But no, not everyone celebrates these holidays. And when I worked at Diversity Awareness Partnership, we actually um, did an annual calendar of over 300 holidays that we would always recognize and celebrate looking at all, I think it was maybe at one time 17 different religions. Um, and we didn't have it all. And once again, this goes to inclusion. Some of us, you know, I'm Christian. Well, ish. Uh, <laughs> Why just said it's the truth? <laughs> my, my religion is love. Uh, that's my religion, It's love and respect. And while I was raised in Christianity, I'm ish. Um, but, you know, there, when we have, such as the religion of Sikh, uh, Sikhism, like, I don't know anything about that. So we would, we actually had an interfaith committee that will give us advice on what we were creating and telling us religions, and we double checked because we could have easily just Googled them and, like, oh, well, this seems right. But that would have been, would not have been authentic. So, all, you know, always including people at the table. Um, Avoid only recognizing Christian holidays, but like I said, at AIJ, I don't really see you doing a, a lot with holidays. But I have noticed, like especially with Aiden being at the front, doing diversity type of holidays over time. And just in case you expand, just being recon recognizing this. All righty. Um, so that was a snippet of a video. And um, I'm going to close these video tabs now. Um, but really that was just, I choose that video because it kind of captures a lot of different types of inclusive language practices that are very general. Um, but that being said, it doesn't paint the whole picture, right? Um, we have some great conversations in the chat if you haven't um, already taken a peek. But um, also that video did not uh, get to mention some LGBTQ plus inclusive language practices. Um, I think she does talk about it in later videos, but for the sake of time, I just want to summarize some ideas very briefly here instead of showing another video to you all. So um, this is uh, something that I'm going to post the chat box um, in case you all want to take a look at a later time. Um, but here are some LGBTQ plus affirming language. 
um, that I like to generally incorporate into my day-to-day -day language. Um, and I'm, I'll be going over some general practices in a few, but um, busting the myths, right? Um, before we wrap up this part, here are a few myth busters about inclusive language. First, it's not about being PC or politically correct. It's about um, respect. Using inclusive language helps us create more respectful and trustworthy spaces for you, your clients, and the people you work with. Um, that's always important too. Uh, next, second myth is that people are too sensitive. Um, it can be difficult to imagine yourself as another person with different challenges because we are so prone to valuing our own experiences, right? Our experiences and perspective over others or outside of our group. Um, sometimes we can't fully understand why people feel excluded by the choices of our words. Um, but we don't need them to describe why, right? We don't, they don't owe us an explanation. Instead, we have to be accountable for our actions and uh, the impacts that um, we can create with our actions. And then lastly, uh, there is a myth that there are more important issues, right? Um, while talking about language might seem small, we know, you know from our early conversation that language is connected to power. Inclusive language is just one easy way to create spaces that are more inclusive of everyone. So overall, some general inclusive language tips. Um, use language that reflects what people call themselves. Um, you may not necessarily always understand why. Again, you don't have to. As service providers, our relationships um, with uh, mutual respect um, with our clients is only earned when you affirm their lived experiences. So first and foremost, listen to your clients, um, call them how they call themselves and leave your egos at the door. And then some general tips, be affirming of different genders, using person-centered empowering language when appropriate, using gender neutral words and pronouns is a good precaution to take before accidentally misgendering someone. Um, and overall recognizing diverse experiences and being mindful of the imagery you use in your conversations. So our final, uh, in, um, our final principle of cultural humility is institutional accountability. So cultural humility certainly begins at the individual level, right? It's in the definition. It's all about self-reflection and a lifelong process of learning. But individual people shouldn't bear the responsibility alone. So we must also find ways to hold our institutions accountable. So being aware that inequities in healthcare and other spaces are perpetuated in different ways. Um, and some ways are harder to see than others. So wherever you do have power and privilege as service providers, as healthcare workers, um, to challenge unequal treatment or unequitable uh, policies, I encourage you to find the strength to speak out. Because the organization that you work at and even the entire system of healthcare itself creates much more long-term and long-lasting impact than any one of us alone can do. So to conclude, why do we do all of this? Um, because uh, as service providers, as people who work with other people, we have to constantly remind ourselves that healthcare and other systems are not equitable or just. So we have to understand that society and institutions are not perfect, they are not impartial, they are not judgment-free or stereotype-free, and that is why providing equal service is not enough. Um, we have to hold ourselves to recognizing these barriers and challenges um, and overall creating equitable services that gives clients what they need to be successful as opposed to equal services that treats clients the same. So lastly, some tips um, to practicing cultural humility, being aware of your own cultural conditioning, your own identities, what you bring to the conversation, right? Um, and then next, learning about cultures that are different from yours and also being open to unlearn and deeply, um, deeply think about um, any 
rooted biases or stereotypes or prejudices you hold. Um, also, when you're working with clients, be mindful of discomfort that can signal cultural difference. So being mindful of your language and communication and overall being perspective uh, perceptive of how your actions and words carry weight. Um, next, recognizing privilege and actively sharing power with others. And then lastly, accept that it's a lifelong process. It's impossible for any one of us to be expert of cultural humility, even me, even as someone who does these types of trainings. Um, remember that it's only with continued education, engagement, even making mistakes along the way, um that we become more culturally humble um so that means after 6 30 the work should still continue continue to hold yourselves your communities your organization your classmates accountable to expanding equity and um here is a quick overview about using cultural humility to inform client-centered counseling um, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over this. Um, but here are a few resources, including that implicit association test that I mentioned before, um, as well as the national class standards, which stand for culturally and linguistically appropriate service standards. Um, that I think is a really great framework for all of us to kind of think about how cultural humility can be implemented in an organization. So with that, I wanted to leave us with a little bit of time for comments and questions if we had any. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you all so much for your um, participation and spending the evening with me. And thank you again, and let me know if you have any questions.